Well, welcome back, everyone. Um, I hope you enjoyed your, your lunch. I hope you did not have trouble opening the little packet of mayo. Um, <laughs> you got this? Awesome. Um, well, it's my distinguished pleasure you know, today to uh, introduce the second panel of the day, um, the panel of digital learning um, resources. And we'll start with uh, two presentations by Beth Flynn, who we heard from Elisa that they've been you know, partnering together. Um, and then after that, uh, we'll have the presentation by uh, Dayamudra uh, Dennehy. So without further ado, let's start. Hi, my name is Beth. Um, before lunch, you had the opportunity to hear from my colleague and partner, Elisa Queenan, um, speak of our journey that we've been on in the last couple of years, designing this virtual exchange course. And so now I'm gonna have the opportunity to talk to you a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of the curriculum and what we've actually created. Um, and so we've had all these ideas um, all different technologies. We've wanted to use virtual reality. We want to use human-centered design. We want to use sustainability goals. We want to help women. And so it's like, how do we organize all this chaos into, you know, kind of a succinct, um, logical model for our students going forth? And so as um, Dr. Queenan spoke to prior to lunch, we're really looking at trying to increase the success rates of our students as well as um, women in the Kurdish region of Iraq for their um, workplace um, goals and outcomes. And so our solution was to create this entrepreneurship and engineering course that I'm gonna speak to you about. Um, high impact practices were actually pretty easy to incorporate into this model. Um, diversity and global learning, obviously, learning communities, um, addressing big questions, experiential and collaborative learning, and then undergraduate research. So we got to hit all of these practices um, developing our model. Our students, Porterville College students in California Central Valley, nice picture, the Sierra's in the background. Um, and then Herbal Polytechnic University, um, particularly women in Kurdish Iraq with that university. We've created a 12-week course. It's designed to have three hours a week of asynchronous learning modules that the students engage in on their own. And then they'll work three hours a week synchronously with our binational meetings that we'll meet on Zoom. And so I'm gonna to speak to the asynchronous portion first, and then I'm gonna go into the synchronous portion. The asynchronous portion um, consists of weekly focused lessons, um, weeks one through 10 that they'll navigate through independently, as well as weeks four through 12, they'll do an individual human-centered design prototyping um, assignment. The weekly focus um, has different themes for this week would be an example of a theme and an assignment the students would engage in. This assignment has been adapted by The Art of the Impossible by Stephen Kotler. Um, and so in this example, students write out 25 things they're curious about. After they do that, they go through and look for patterns and then identify what they're really passionate about in life. And from there, then, they map that passion to one of the UN sustainability goals that best reflects that passion. Um, the UN sustainability goals are the same ones that Fran were talking about um, prior. Week four through 12, the students go through an individual human-centered design prototyping assignment, and they go through the whole human-centered design um, problem solution iteration here, but the main focus is to give them an opportunity to engage in some technology that they're not, they've never done before, right? Um, and so right now, these are the technologies that we're working with. This is why Elisa keeps me around. Um, <clears throat> and so <laughs> right now, they have the choice of doing some kind of 3D design, a website design, or doing VR content. So they still would identify the UN sustainability goal first, 
Um, and then they would go out into their community, identify a problem, and then create, create an appropriate prototype. And so if they chose um, that 3D design would be a good choice for their prototype, things that this would work well for if they want to perhaps redesign a community space to better meet the needs of the community, that would be a good idea. Or if they want to create some other kind of physical object, then the 3D um, design is something that they might want to choose for their project. Another choice that they have is to make a website. This is an informational website one of our students prototyped to educate people about reducing landscape water use. And the newest um, prototype that we're adding to our collection is using VR content. And uh, you can laugh at my, um, my cardboard viewers, but if you're not aware, there are a lot of directions out there on how you can take cardboard and plastic bottles and you can make these cardboard viewers. You can use them with your phones and download software. And so this could be accessible to students without economic means is the idea that from recycled products and their phone that they could um, participate in VR. <clears throat> so that would be what they would participate in during the asynchronous um, learning modules. Synchronously, again, we would meet three hours a week. The first week, we're going to model the human-centered design process. Week two through four, they're going to do small team weekly iterations of that design process within the um, constraints of the three-hour time limit that we're meeting. And then weeks five through 12, they'll work in small teams for a more in-depth focus. We intentionally set this up this way because we felt that the students weren't proficient or even knew what they were doing until the very end of the semester. And so we really wanted to see what could they do if they already had a handle on this process before they went into their in-depth focus. So our hope is that by modeling at week one and then giving them like kind of a speed round opportunity, weeks two through four, that by the time they get to the small team in-depth focus, that they're gonna be much more confident and proficient and creative with their problem solving. Again, you know, we're gonna model the human-centered design process. This is the lens that we're doing all of our problem solution um, iterations. They're always gonna pick one of the SDGs that they're gonna focus on. Um, week two through four, this is just kind of the cadence of our meeting time for the first couple of weeks where they're doing this speed dating, so to speak, with their human-centered design. Um, we'll have random assignments of teams in the SDG assignment of a country, they'll pick a problem, identify stakeholders. This will all require, obviously, online research, live, right? They're gonna have to be quick about this um, to identify in stakeholders of a problem in a country and get some empathy going there. So then they'll define their problem statement, of course, brainstorm their solutions, and then at the end of, um, the, end of the meeting time, they will share out their prototype and testing plan. So that's what will happen for weeks two through four. After that, they'll go into small teams that they will be in for the duration of the course. And again, at the beginning of each of these problem solution iterations with the human-centered design process, they're gonna pick an SDG. And then this is an example of some interview questions that our students developed after picking SDG number three, which I think is um, well-being and so they went out and interviewed community members about the impact of alcohol and non-prescription drugs that they've had um, on their lives after they do that they go ahead and they code those responses looking for themes and they do uh, desirability feasibility mapping of those needs that the community has identified right the students don't identify the needs the community did, the students just found those needs within their responses. 
And so, as you can see, anything to the left is considered less feasible. Anything down on the mapping is less desirable. And if we zoom in for this particular group, they decided that stress was the most desirable and feasible problem that they, they could define. And so their definition of their problem statement, teens and young adults need a way to cope with stress because stress is a big factor that can lead to substance abuse. So that's kind of the journey that they took to even get to this definition here. And they came up with a lot of ideas. They sit in a group and they brainstorm. And this particular group decided to come up with a kind of program that encouraged young adults and teens to exercise with their pets. Whether that be a pet they owned or whether they went to the shelter and kind of teamed up with the shelter to provide some opportunities there. And so their whole prototype um, and project was around developing what this idea would look like. While they're prototyping, they do a SWOT analysis, looking at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, both internally and externally, of their idea. As well as a PESTEL analysis, looking at political, economic, social, technological, legal, and environmental factors. So this is all part of prototyping, <clears throat> looking at you know, what, are, what are they going to create? What is their solution going to look like? They also need to, of course, look at competitors, right? They can't come up with a product or a solution that's already out there. Um, <clears throat> and then, of course, they need to test, right? This would be considered the first iteration of many iterations of their solution addressing whatever problem it is that they defined. And so that's the structure of our course. Like I said, 12 weeks, three hours asynchronously, three hours synchronously, really focusing on here, you can see they're going through this humor-centered design um, three different ways, right? So they're doing it individually, they're doing their in-depth focus in a small group, and they're also doing the weekly iterations in the beginning. So our hope is that this structure will give them the confidence and the agency that afterwards that they can address any problem they choose. Um, challenges? Um, just being really intentional about the curriculum, really intentional about what did we actually want to achieve and whatever idea that was, did that directly support that goal? Being intentional about language that we used, making sure the assignments and language seemed cross-cultural and that there wouldn't be problems about that. Um, time, time to work, time to get things done. Um, Time in the course, right? We can't be like, you're going to take a 20-hour course with us all semester, right? Um, but I think we could fill it up if we wanted to. Next steps, we really want to expand the use of VR and some other technologies and maybe do some cultural exchange. Um, I have some ideas I would love for them to just be able to, you know, maybe take their safe, favorite space in their home community and share that, um, share that across, across borders. We want to scale this to further countries, cultures, and age groups. And hopefully, we're going to offer the course in the fall. Personal takeaways, um, I would say my own agency. Um, I think before I did this project, I never realized how far beyond the borders of my classroom I could go. And um, so I think. You know, we're really trying to give the students their own agency, but I definitely developed that myself doing this. And like um, Dr. Queenan said, just the realization of the capabilities of the students, just seeing what they can do if you give them the time and space, it, it's really amazing. Um, <clears throat> number three, letting go. You know, I, I know it's surprising from the looks of it, but I don't know. Oh, now I look at. I don't know how to do VR. <laughs> I know, it looks like an, an expert, right? I don't really know how to make websites. I am a terrible 3D um, modeler, right? And it's definitely possible for my students to be better than me before they got to class, or they'll be better than me before they end the course, and I have to be okay with that, because I don't have time to be an expert in all these things before I incorporate them into my classroom, right? So. Um, letting go is definitely something that, that I've learned. 
And so I just want to thank, obviously, my partner, Dr. Elise Queenan, and our partner over in Herbal Polytechnic Institute or University. First, Ellis, Fiza, Nelson, and Kristen, thank you all for your support. Mudra, our next speaker. You may take it. Hi, everyone. So as community college educators, we often talk about preparing students for the real world. But what does this actually mean? What are the skills our students need for success in the 21st century for their professions, for their academics, for their personal lives, and to be part of their communities? I'm Dr. Diamudra Dennehy. I teach ESL at City College of San Francisco. So my Stanford EPIC project is a canvas-based curriculum in three aspects. The first is skills for the 21st century based on the data from the World Economic Forum. And second is storytelling for students to showcase their backgrounds and skills. And third, um, wellness, so that to integrate uh, emotional and mental and physical wellness into our learning communities. So first we start with storytelling and I like the idea of taking uh, students taking what they learn to tell a new story about themselves. So this comes from the story factor. She outlines six types of stories and so this is sort of the structure of the curriculum the students will leave with different stories about themselves. And so this is the outcome of the story. So I thought I'd talk about the design of the curriculum. And I really love this uh, quote from Bell Hooks. And she talks about generating excitement in our classrooms, being interested in one another hearing one another's voices and recognizing one another's presence. So sort of having that as the foundation of our work. So we combine, as I said, storytelling, 21st century skills, wellness and resilience practices. I've curated a variety of resources and I've designed this curriculum for ESL, but it can really be adapted for any discipline. It's an evolving living document that other uh, professors can adapt to their own courses and they can remix and make their own playlists. So these are the themes of the modules, the different units in the course, and these are all pulled from the list from the World Economic Forum. So each module has one of these themes. And then the themes are linked to the stories. So for example, the first module is an overview of the 21st century skills and the stories the students will tell is their vision for themselves. The second is clear communication. The story is who I am. And then I added a storytelling module and then a conclusion. And then I also added a new type of story. I have a story to tell where they integrate everything that they've done. So this is an example of how it looks in Canvas. So there's a module, and then I also created a bonus module for each unit with extra information. So these are just three sample modules. So each module starts with a guided tour video that I've made myself. There's a variety of multimodal assignments. Students do integrated writing. They document what they're learning in a digital portfolio that they can take away from the class. And then they do a personal reflection at the end of every module to kind of build in that metacognition. And then there's a summary that leads us into the next module. So here's an example of a module on communication, exploring NVC, nonviolent communication, listening skills, communicating skills, why conversations can go wrong, and then your story for becoming a better communicator. And for ESL in particular, you know, a lot of these things are culturally embedded. And if you're communicating in a new language, you know, there are a lot of obstacles. So really unpacking what it means to communicate beyond our basic listening, speaking skills that we usually teach. Here's another module on resilience. The students really like learning about what they call soft skills, victory pose uh, from one of my favorite TED Talks by Amy Cuddy, the brain and exercise. Here's an example of an assignment page 
Um, I use the Stanford colors in my design. <laughs> An example on uh, flexibility and really focused on the brain and neuroplasticity. And then things that couldn't fit or things that were maybe too complicated to put in the module, I put as bonus uh, materials. So for example, there's the actual report from the World Economic Forum if they wanted to look through that, if they wanted to look through the summary of the World Economic Forum, and if they wanted to start designing their own resume, they could start applying what they learned but it's not sort of a resume writing course exactly. Some other things, you know, I found some really cool podcasts they might want to listen to to build their listening skills, how to politely interrupt, again, it's totally culturally embedded, introverts, happiness. So this is the actual list. This list was put together right before the pandemic in 2020, of uh, skills that students would need for 2025. So starting with analytical thinking, going down to problem solving. And it's also really useful for students to be able to look at an infographic and understand the patterns and sort of look at the four categories that they created, color-coded, problem solving, self-management, working with people, tech. And then this um, update was released at the beginning of May. So it's kind of fun how the materials kind of keep updating. And there are some new things you might notice. So creative thinking moved to the top of the list. And then resilience, flexibility, and agility were kind of grouped together. And then AI and big data got its own little category. And then I looked at um, what some tech leaders or leaders of industry said they're looking for when they hire new talent. So all these things that we've seen on the list, agility, flexibility, curiosity, growth mindset, resilience. So an opportunity for students to think, do I have these skills? How could I develop them more? And how can I develop what I have? How can I foster what I haven't developed yet? And all of this is part of a new story about themselves. Somebody else says ability to engage and adapt, personal well-being, this has come up a lot, empathy, openness to continued growth, the ability to express oneself. And then I also pulled from a book that I really like called Becoming a Master Student. And they have a list of master student qualities that can be sort of mapped on to these uh, World Economic Forum qualities. So there's 24 what they call master student qualities. And just to show you a few, um, inquisitive, focused, willing to change. So we reflect on that. And again, you know, students to have this language in their pocket to be able to answer if someone says, tell me about yourself. You know, they're able to use these um, categories to talk about their own experience, their own gifts and talents. And I really like the emotional part too, right? That they're joyful. And then the last thing is um, sort of the mental aspect. So attitudes, affirmations, visualizations, building higher order thinking skills. And part of communication, giving feedback. I think especially working on a team Working on a team in a different country, how do you give feedback? So one technique is, um, I think we've all learned the sandwich technique. It's becoming a little outdated. Now it's being replaced with the wrap. <laughs> <laughs> Getting more international, so the feedback wrap. And so we really practiced this, and we had some really interesting conversations about how you give feedback in China versus how you give feedback in Japan. And then, you know, what constructive criticism is. I think especially if you're speaking a second language, this can get a little messy. So um, how to give criticism in another language. And then I really loved uh, something I saw on Twitter that I copied, just the traditional character in Chinese for listening incorporates the ear, the eyes, and the heart. It's a very complicated character. And so I uh, tested some of these uh, lessons uh, at a school that I started in India. These are students that have dropped out of high school from caste oppressed communities, and they really loved learning some of these skills. Um, this is some feedback. So one student said he really understood soft skills, 
Um, emotional intelligence were ex excellent skills for me to improve myself. Uh, we talked about giving an I message. Through I message, we can easily communicate with each other. A lot of uh, response to the soft skills, right? So eye contact, body language, how to ask interesting questions, right? Really part of communication. The master student skills. And then I love this quote, by studying body language, I understand how to be brave on a stage and make my posture to be bold. And these are some of my beautiful students from India. And then I also um, piloted some of the lessons with my own students at City College. So one student, Ryan, said, I, under I learned there's a gradual shift towards self-development, self-improvement. The shift is important, especially in the age of AI. Most interesting was well-being and empathy. So, you know, really bringing in this emotional aspect to our development. And then I really love this too. Your lesson helped me realize that I'm learning to be a leader, a good employee, not only a good student with straight A's. <laughs> So this uh, curriculum lives on Canvas, and you're welcome to check it out. And as we finish, I just want to say thank you, especially to Kristen, who has guided us with so much grace and with <laughs> Nelson and Ellis and Faiza. And thank you to the tech team for supporting us today. And thank you to the people who fed us. I don't think they get appreciated very much. So thank you, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Beth, Diane Woodruff, for, for the presentations. We do have some, uh, some time now for Q&A. So any takers? Mark. I have a question for Diane Woodruff. Mm. Um, it's a very fascinating soft skill. Mm. I'm just wondering how do you grade that for your students? How do you grade your students with soft skills in, in, in giving them evaluations? Yes. Yeah, so the the way that I set up my course is there's just a lot of reflection and then a lot of like a digital portfolio. So a lot of it is just completing the assignment. So it's not so much evaluative as, you know, them evaluating themselves and reflecting. So just having them participate in discussions with one another and reflection and then writing that starts with a paragraph and then becomes a longer writing. So the summative assessment at the end is all the stories that they've written that kind of accumulate into one big story. So that's sort of my assessment. I, 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 I think I would like to do that too, you know, because we're so, we're so caught up in the, the grade thing. Mm -hmm. It messes up people's ways of competing. And, and, uh, competing for a grade, I'd like to follow your example of mm -hmm. that. And, but you know, we're forced to give a set of grades. I wish everyone could uh, have sort of a pass-fail approach, but, but I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Julian. I have a question for Beth. So did you ever have situations where the students uh, on the opposite ends, maybe one of them just fell off the face of the earth or, you know, it happens sometimes in our classes. So how do you, you know, bridge those situations? Yeah, we've definitely had situations where the students kind of at one end or the other disappear. Um, it happens and we've had in previous iterations our students had particular roles within their team they were assigned oh you're the manager or you know you're you're in charge of time management or something and so if someone dropped off hopefully they weren't the manager but we just kind of made other students pick up the slack with the understanding that this is how the real world works right like sometimes you pick up the slack for your coworkers. Um, so I mean it's, it's been an issue yeah definitely we still experience it So I have a question for Dea Mudra. So you teach over at City College, mm -hmm. and then your presentation you know, brought you to India <laughs> and, teaching, and teaching there. So I was wondering if you can just expand upon you know, that opportunity. How did you go about um, having that opportunity to teach those particular students? Um, I, I didn't hear that from it's your kind presentation. kind of a long story, but I um, started you. my own nonprofit 15 years ago, and so I go every year to India. It's my own. Um, 
it's my own project. I started that school, so it's my school. <laughs> yeah, that I do in my free time. <laughs> Do we have any any more any more questions? We still have some time. Okay. Well, thank you, uh, both of you. Now, well, <laughs> and now we'll move on to our next set of uh, speakers. So, uh, Ellis, you want to? Yeah, yeah. Sorry, is this on? Now we have the pleasure uh, to have our final three. Uh, this is Tom Chen is going to start us off, uh, followed by Allison Gerganis and Allison Tripp. So take it away, Tom. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to echo ev everybody has been saying that uh, we thank you for uh, you know, coming and to spend almost the whole day on this gorgeous uh, Saturday you know, with us. So we really appreciate that. Uh, the good news is that uh, uh, whatever, everything that I want to say has been said already <laughs> by all our speakers and uh, uh, in fact, you know, the, the keynote, uh, keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Abraham, uh, and uh, so this is actually a good time to just take a power nap <laughs> for the next 15 minutes. <laughs> But I do want to thank Jennifer and uh, the Department of uh, uh, Education, the Title VI uh, uh, Center's grant uh, for their support. And uh, also, of course, the Stanford uh, Global Studies uh, Division. And uh, mostly, of course, the uh, amazing faculty. Oh, I'm sorry. So, OK. The, yeah. The amazing uh, faculty and staff of the EPIC Community College Outreach Program. Uh, you guys have been just, just uh, you know, providing us all the support and the encouragement uh, over the last year. Uh, so I decided to change my uh, title to uh, Cross Border Weird Biology, <laughs> <laughs> based on my <laughs> Army's uh, excellent talk. <laughs> So, uh, so I'm Tom Chen. I teach biology at Santa Monica College. And uh, again, I think this has been shown uh, you know, by Juliana earlier. Uh, so this is the makeup. Uh, so this is the makeup of Santa Monica College. So you can see, just like all community colleges, uh, our students are very, very diverse you know, in terms of uh, uh, the race, ethnicity. Almost 70% are you know, students of color. But I also want to point out that uh, like, you know, our, our college serves almost one third of the non-traditional students. Uh, most of them worked 40 plus hours a week. And uh, just like uh, many of the students in my evening class, and I love it because they not only work hard, they are highly, highly motivated and they, they know uh, how to study and how to you know, do everything. So I really enjoyed you know, what, uh, what I'm doing here. And this, of course, uh, just shows that the California Community Colleges uh, again, you know, serves more, about 70% of students of color, mostly Latinx, African Americans, and Asians, and also uh, multiracial. And this actually uh, mirrors exactly what the, the high school graduates in California uh, you know, is too. So what is the issue? Well, the issue is that uh, uh, as shown in this uh, recent publication, that is also has been supported by many, many earlier publications uh, in this particular topic. You can see that almost for centuries, since the beginning of the first biology textbook, <laughs> uh, almost there you can see 90, about 90 percent of the uh, scientists featured in these uh, textbooks are white males. <laughs> And again, <laughs> uh, I think I mean, we, we got a lot to uh, talk about and collaborate. <laughs> so, and in fact, I want to uh, talk to you about uh, Fulbright too. <laughs> so here, you know, we have all the, you know, the resources. Uh, so this actually does, does not represent 
the general population, in fact, this is the 2010 census because the public publication this paper, uh, you know, the 2020 census results you know, was not uh, available yet. And also, you can see it uh, does not re you know, reflect the uh, percent of the biology student population is a major, major, you know, big gap. So uh, this is really, of course, it's not to diminish the historic and the monumental contributions of these uh, earlier scientists. But a lot of other scientists, they also could have been, you know, uh, better and pro properly credited. So this is the problem. And uh, one example, of course, uh, you all know, the Nobel uh, laureates, Watson and Crick, uh, they are credited in delineating the structure of the, uh, our genetic code, DNA, the double, famous double helix structure. But uh, uh, really, they got the idea from Rosalind Franklin, uh, who actually see an image of the DNA <laughs> uh, uh, structure. And this is perhaps you know, the most viewed of images, images you know, in, uh, in modern history, right? But uh, Rosalind Frank, frankly, is mostly left out of the picture. So what is the problem? Well, of course, this disparity uh, has been shown to be a contributing factor that discourages women, minorities, and so on from entering a STEM field and the career. So these are the faces of, of uh, students from Santa Monica College on, on the first day of school. Every, everybody looked happy. <laughs> <laughs> but if I ask them to write a story, well, today there's a lot of storytelling, right? And, you know, and I love that. Uh, if I ask them to write their own story as a, kind of as an ice maker on the first week of class, and I want to show four examples here. Okay, so uh, Tiffany, uh, she's a well-mannered uh, African-American lady, uh, always sit, sit you know, on the front row of my class, but you can see that she does not even have a safe, safe space to go back every, every night, okay, you know, that she can call home. And uh, another one, 45-year-old JT from Sunnyvale. She did not realize that she actually is a trans man until she was 18 okay, or 19. Uh, so that makes him kind of uh, you know, uh, not, not a viable candidate for not a lot of jobs, even though he is very, very talented and with a lot of you know, experiences. And uh, another screen. She's an A-plus student in my class. But she recalled that uh, uh, you know, her hardworking mother worked all kinds of odd jobs, including delivering pizza. Uh, but she saved enough change for, from her kid and uh, was able to take the family for a dream vacation at the Disney. <laughs> and then this uh, black young man uh, okay, so again, he, he, he has a single mom, work, working two jobs, and when she had another baby, okay, when he was 10 year old, uh, he had to assume the father's role. And this went on until the last two years of high school, and uh, he was talking about the stress that he has is so much that he cannot even talk about. And I, can, I cannot talk about it, <laughs> right? So these are really, could, could have been my role models, right? Uh, but what they really need is a role model so that can keep them in school and then choose a career in you know, STEM or in other areas so that later they can get a, a good job and a career. So this is uh, what we are facing now. And uh, so what, what motivates me uh, in taking on this project Number one, representations, right? Like I just talked about, that our textbook uh, did not give them the kind of role model that the, the students can really relate to. Right? And uh, also, 
we have a lot of <laughs> you know, storytellings. I love storytellings, right? okay? Except if I, you know, of course, you know, if I don't have to tell the story, because I'm not a, <laughs> a good storyteller. <laughs> So I, but I love to listen to like uh, NPR's uh, story course, and now uh, what? Tell me more, uh, and so on. Uh, and uh, one secret that I have, most of my friends and the colleagues uh, uh, did not know, is I love to read obituaries <laughs> because every single story makes me want it to be a better person, like the person you know, in the story. So storytelling is uh, very, very powerful. And of course, there's really n no shortage in inspiring scientists. For example, like this uh, traveling exhibit okay, from the National Academy of Science that is actually on display at the Santa Monica, Santa Monica College now. Uh, there are many, many inspiring scientists. But uh, if, if, you think, if you think about globally, Right? Just multiply, multiply this by 195 countries and uh, probably multiply by dozens and dozens of disciplines. We will be able to find inspiring scientists, biologists, and you know, in virtually every you know, area from art history to weird uh, psychology, <laughs> for example. Right? So, uh, and then also if we think, think in terms of, you know, in the context that most of these people, probably more than one billion people live uh, in poverty uh, on two dollars a day, right? And, uh, you know, survival is uh, what they are, you know, you know, thinking about, you know, every day. And then not to mention the discrimination and the persecution, okay, of many, many people around the world just because of their race, Sex, sexual orientation, religious beliefs, and uh, you know all those things, right? So, there, just like the, our keynote speakers, you know, talk about uh, streets of uh, uh, streets of gold. There has to be a a gold mine, okay, of inspiring stories all around the world, right? Okay. So that is uh, you know what motivated me in uh, you know, doing this job. Well, also, also you know, in reality, uh, Pharaoh Khufu did not build a Great Pyramid, right? and uh, Emperor Qin Shi Huang did not build the Great Wall. And uh, with all due respect, Leland Stanford, <laughs> he probably made the deal, but he did not, did not build the western portion of the Transcontinental Railroad. Right? So, so who, who built it? Well, these unsung heroes. Uh, and he's, he was one of the speakers uh, you know, at our program. Uh, so this is really painstakingly researched and elegantly written by Dr. Gordon Chan. Okay. So these are kind of the lessons that, that we learned and uh, how we can change how education enterprise that fa had, you know, have failed our students okay, over centuries. Okay, so, so this, you know, my goal of this project basically is uh, to build an easily accessible and user-friendly database of compelling stories to celebrate cross-cultural biologists and inspire the first-gen women and the uh, students of color to enter uh, you know, STEM fields. And uh, what I, uh, basically my objectives and action plans are, of course, to uh, collect the data and then disseminate the database on uh, some kind of a web, web page, which is uh, still being worked on, because I have to depend on a webmaster to help me <laughs> you know, build this, uh, uh, all this uh, uh, database. And uh, so this will be uh, an open forum that is available to all students and educators. So why educators? Because I, I like when, when I, uh, give a lecture on cell bio biology, for example. I like to start, you know, as an opening slide. Uh, use, you know, uh, some, you know, uh, scientists, for example, like uh, Rosalind Franklin and, and so on. Okay. So, uh, and then of course, uh, this is an open access so that everybody can contribute uh, and build this uh, collection. And then I cannot think of a better way to engage my students 
simply because basically I told Nelson because I'm lazy. <laughs> I lay all my students <laughs> to do the work. Uh, so this is actually a project-based lear learning. And uh, uh, of course, with clear you know, instructions and the rubric to empower them you know, to own their own learning and the supported uh, growth mindset. So this is uh, basically what, what I did over the last year. And I, I, I kind of uh, had the idea because uh, a number of years ago, I took a sabbatical leave uh, you know, from Santa Monica country. I didn't go to any exotic places like Florence, Italy. Uh, but I did walk uh, every inch of uh, soil on the campus. I identified all the trees and the shrubs and then put a tag okay, on the trees with a QR code. So for example, like this is the you know, magnificent uh, uh, Morton Bay fig. And then students can scan the code and then retrieve all the information about that species. Mm -hmm. And then they can also we have, you know, with a help with the vendor, uh, we created this uh, plans map so that students can also click on this uh, green dot and also get everything that they, they want to learn about the tree. And also, of course, a year ago, when we were at this uh, intensive, you know, summer intensive workshop, we got to uh, tour the you know, Hoover Institute and uh, uh, Ramsey's uh, map lab, and that also gave me the idea that you know, we can do something okay, you know, with this uh, ins inspiring biologist project. Okay, so, so over the last year, this is what, I, what I've done. Uh, every semester at the beginning, students were, each student were assigned a country, and then they will have the whole semester to research uh, at least one scientist, biologist. And in the middle of the, the semester, they will create a slide. So that uh, summarizes the scientist's uh, accomplishments and also why you know, uh, the scientists inspired them. And then the rest of the semester, they will you know, write an essay uh, emphasizing why these scientists inspire you know, them. So this, this is just an example of one of the earlier semesters that we have. And uh, uh, so we, after they turn in their assignment, uh, so these are the name of those uh, scientists, and then they are cap categorized in two, you know, indexed in two different uh, sub-disciplines. So again, uh, educators can, when they are talking about DNA, they can just uh, you know, go to that the scientist and then uh, retrieve it and share with the, the, the class. Uh, and then I also group all the, the biologists in two, three categories. Uh, historic figures, okay, so they are you know, in the past. Uh, established contemporary scientists and also uh, young scientists, okay, whom I call rising stars, okay? So again, so they can also be uh, indexed, uh, indexed and uh, searched uh, that way. And uh, so this is an example of what, what we have collected so far. Uh, there are about 120 or so biologists uh, uh, represented you know, by about 90 different countries and so on. Uh, and this is going to be, you know, keep growing, growing, growing. Uh, in the last you know, few minutes, I just want to kind of share a few examples, okay, a few slides. Uh, for example, this actually is uh, what I, when I sent out an email to, to um, my department asking for help. <laughs> you know, we also have uh, you know, faculty from different countries and so on. And uh, Eunice uh, Food uh, was uh, you know, uh, recommended to me. And then independently, thank you, Mark, also emailed me, said that, hey, you know, maybe you want to uh, you know, feature this scientist. And uh, uh, Eunice Fu, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't think uh, she's a doctor uh, because she's an amateur scientist. And uh, uh, these are exactly the same slides that was, you know, was turned in by my students. Uh, you have to realize that they kind of had having the fuzzy idea of uh, PhD, MDs, and so on is so far away from them, right? Okay. Uh, so, but anyway, she's the first person uh, actually scientifically or experimentally shown that the carbon dioxide could be the uh, greenhouse gas that will result in trap, you know, heat trapped uh, in the atmosphere. And uh, if we have listened to her, 
back in the 1850s, just think about you know, what could I be different, different now. And she's also a, an activist, activist of uh, women's rights too. But many of the scientists, they are also activists uh, on women's rights. And of course, uh, here's this, the first person from you know, Congo. Uh, the, he is a doctor. Uh, he uh, identified the Ebola virus, but he has never been recognized until just recently. And uh, this is my, one of my favorites, uh, Dr. Q. Many of you know, know of uh, Dr. Q. Uh, he's from Mexico, and he jumped the fence uh, not once, but twice. And about uh, sent back, and then he en finally ended up in the Central Valley. Uh, and he worked all kinds of work, you know, odd, job, odd jobs, and this is where he stayed, uh, in the hot uh, you know, Central Valley. And, uh, you know, he, uh, he, he said he wanted to learn English, English and uh, his cousin told him, this is your life. Uh, you, know, you don't learn English, you know, this, you're going to work in the, you know, in the field for the rest of your life. Right? But you know, he ended up uh, you know, uh, taking English in a community college and uh, got accepted to UC Der Berkeley and then uh, graduated cum laude from Harvard Medical School. And uh, he became the chief surgeon of uh, the Hopkins medical school and right now he's uh, the chair of neuro neurological surgery uh, you know at the Mayo Institute so and during that time you know, twice he, he almost got killed okay, you know falling in into a uh, you know, petroleum uh, tank so he's, uh, you know, and he's still actively engaging uh, mentoring you know, minorities and uh, giving talks uh, to you know, in minority conferences and how about uh, Kelly Lian, uh, she is uh, triple amputated uh, when she was you know, eight year old and uh, raised by a blind mom. But uh, uh, you know, she did not let that deter. Uh, oh, it's time. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Sorry. Uh, all right. <laughs> this is good. <laughs> it's like my like my students. <laughs> okay, uh, so, uh, so these are just um, some examples, and I, I, I really want to point out that uh, uh, she just left. Oh, you're, you're here. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm honored. One of our rising stars, Dr. Sarah Isabel, is with us. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> right. and, Again, you, know, you can read you know, this posting. You know, she did not have an easy life, but right now she's a graduate student. Uh, and thank you, uh, Nelson, for intro introducing me to her. And uh, you know, she takes time and talk to my students. Get, you know, get you know, uh, my students interview her, and the, the student told me this is a, this is a life changing experience for him. Okay, so let me uh, run through so. Of course, uh, <laughs> the challenge is <laughs> time. <laughs> and well, I won't go into all these other challenges and lessons learned. Uh, but from the outside of this uh, project, I know uh, this is going to be an open-ended uh, work, work in progress. <laughs> okay. uh, you know, so uh, this could lead to a lifelong uh, project uh, to me. So where do I get money? Maybe my pension, <laughs> if I can. Uh, but luckily, uh, NIH has programs you know, to support similar projects like this. And also, I want to talk to Amy uh, to see about the Fulbright, because uh, at the end of the day, nothing compares to just talking to and inspiring scientists uh, and get to travel around the world. <laughs> All right, so thank you. <laughs> I do want to uh, give a big uh, shout out to yeah, uh, Christine. Right. Thank you so much. Now uh, we're going to pass it over to, to Allison. Allison yes. Hey, everyone. So um, my name is Allison Gerganis. I am the online services uh, librarian at San Diego Mesa College. I've also been the acting instruction librarian and the chair of the School of Learning Resources and Academic Support for quite a while. <laughs> so, 
As you've listened to the presentations today, you've heard the brilliant work of my colleagues who are subject-specific area experts. I, as a community college librarian, am a generalist. By that, I mean that the joy of being a community college librarian is we get to work with all of the curricular areas and therefore have an opportunity to affect a far-reaching audience which can translate into thousands of students each year. On my campus, we teach our students information literacy in both the synchronous and asynchronous modalities. The online platform that is used to support face-to-face -face and online instruction in the majority of California community college classrooms is called Canvas, which you've heard a bunch of times today. Um, to that end, for my EPIC project, I've created a globalized information literacy modules in Canvas. If you'd like to look at the modules during the presentation, you can capture this QR code with your phone or take the shortened uh, case-sensitive bit.ly URL at the bottom of the slide. But don't worry, um, at, at the end, I'm going to be putting up the QR code and the shortened URL up a, a few more times. So if you don't catch it now, you can catch it later if you feel like it. So these Canvas modules are not only available to my co college community, but they have been published in an area called the Canvas Commons, where they can be downloaded for free by anyone with a faculty Canvas account. So now I'm going to change the slide, but once again, you'll have those available to you later. Oh, that did come out right, did it? Oh, all right. So what is information literacy and why is it important? The definition we as academic librarians like to point to comes from the Association of College and Research Librarians Framework for Information Literacy in Higher Education. I put a key quote on this slide, which I'm going to read for you uh, for the sake of emphasis. It states that information literacy is the set of integrated abilities encompassing the reflective discovery of information, the understanding of how information is produced and valued, the use of information in creating new knowledge, and participating ethically in communities of learning. I realize that's a bit of a mouthful, but we believe that it is important for our communities to understand that information literacy is more than just research skills. Information literacy skills are often needed in everyday life. I've pulled some out and put them on this slide to give you an idea of things that we do every day in personal and scholarly interactions that require these skills. We know that we evaluate the credibility of sources when we're assessing scholarly works, but we also do this when we compare product reviews on consumer sites like Amazon. In that same vein, when we want to verify the credibility of a source in our daily life or scholarly pursuits, we often find ourselves looking at multiple sources to discern what is right. And at this point, it may be important to point out the necessity of knowing how to distinguish between real and fake news, which is becoming increasingly difficult in this era of easily manipulated artifacts and commentary that can be created by artificial intelligence. Lastly, I've noted that an information literate person can take reliable sources and weigh them against one another to draw informed conclusions. While these are only a sample of the skills incorporated in the teaching of information literacy, if we were all to master those, we would be better scholars, consumer researchers, and be more savvy in the area of civic engagement. But what of digital literacy, or perhaps media literacy? These phrases have become more popular as our technological world has expanded. In fact, listed on this slide are a number of skills and abilities, including digital and media literacy, that fall under the umbrella of information literacy. While the common fallacy is that information literacy is incorporated in the first bullet, research skills, it really is so much more. There are cross-curricular tie-ins we teach students, such as the various biases incorporated in algorithms that we encounter in our search engines, and the reason that citing a source is ethically important. My point here is to help you understand that there is a place for information literacy in all curricular areas in some form or fashion. Information literacy is actually so important at my college that it has long stood as one of our institutional learning outcomes. You can see all five of them represented here. Institutional learning outcomes, which I'll call ILOs, are designed to help guide individual departments and disciplines in the development of student learning outcomes for programs, courses, and services as well as to help shape the decision-making processes of the college. In a perfect world, all curricular areas would cover all institutional learning outcomes in all classes. However, there are faculty members who believe this can be a tall order depending on their discipline. Now, looking at the ILOs here, we already know that good information literacy instruction actually already covers critical thinking, professional and ethical behavior, as well as communication. So by adding in global consciousness into a comprehensive information literacy instruction practice, we can actually cover every one of our ILOs in our curriculum. 
But how do we find the time? As important as our ILOs are, what we as librarians often hear from classroom faculty is that they don't have the time to incorporate all of them comprehensively into their curriculum. As experts in the field of information literacy, we have historically asked on-campus faculty to bring their classes to us in the library or have us guest lecture in their classrooms, but class time is valuable and many can't work us in. Even for those that can, the one-shot instruction only goes so far. Students really need ongoing reinforcement and just-in-time information literacy instruction weaved throughout their learning experience. To add to this conundrum, in the California Community College libraries, there tends to be a small number of librarians, and if all curricular areas were to actually search us out for direct instruction, we would not be able to accommodate the influx of requests. So, bring on the Canvas modules. The joy of the information literacy modules that I've created for my EPIC project is that they are flexible and can be used in the Canvas platform in a variety of ways. They can, of course, be used all together as a comprehensive information literacy instruction unit, but a professor can also choose to use single page or multiple pages sprinkled throughout or use individual sections that emphasize a particular topic of information literacy like searching and evaluating websites. So I wanted these, web I wanted these to be as flexible as possible. The goal here is that the student will get right on time information literacy instruction as their class progresses. So let's dive into the modules. Uh, if you're interested, again, there's the QR code and the shortened URL. Um, and I'm going to walk through the major areas. Um, I'm going to walk through the major areas. This is, this is if you just want to dive into the, what's actually in them. So the first module, it's an introduction to the faculty. What you see here is a portion of my first page, which purposefully has a relaxed picture of me as opposed to an overly professional one. My goal here is to start by humanizing the experience for the professor. Incorporating information liter instru literacy instruction can be seen as a lofty goal, and I want to bring it down to earth. This module is intended to give the faculty member an overview of each individual module, as well as an introduction to what information literacy is, much like what I did for you a few minutes ago. I also use the opportunity to put some focus on making the choice to globalize some of their curricular decisions. So here, more specifically, I have a snapshot of the page of globalizing curriculum. It explains a bit about my EPIC fellowship journey and gives a number of globalized research ideas to consider, such as decolonizing our idea of fashion history, looking at the environmental impact that a single food item can have on its journey to your plate, reasons for femicide around the world, medical tourism and greenwashing. The first student module is entitled The Research Process. It takes the student through finding a topic, narrowing the topic, discovering the best keywords for searching, which type of information sources are the best for our particular research needs, and the difference between popular, professional, and scholarly sources. Now here is one of the first pages in that module. So it starts by explaining to students that a research topic can come from anywhere. In this example, the student has run across a TikTok video while looking for Star Wars trivia that takes, it, it takes a turn and talks about um, how the hair of Princess Leia in the first original Star Wars movie was inspired by the female soldiers called Las Soldaderas during the Mexican Revolution. This then inspires the student to search on TikTok for another video that explains more about who these women were. And from there, they're off to the races with a potential research topic for their paper. This is an example of where I'm using short, engaging videos to make the subject matter relatable and accessible. In the modules, I include more short YouTube videos, images, and infographics to break up the text and keep their interest. The next student module takes them through a series of pages that teaches them how to search for and evaluate websites. The first page is called Introduction, The Problem with Water, and it begins with an example of a quote, water, water everywhere, and not a drop to drink by Samuel Taylor Coolridge from The Rime of the Ancient Mariner in 1797, which, once considered by my fictional student, brings them to think about the difficulty people around the world have with gaining clean water by which to live. This causes them to do some YouTube searching that brings them to a short video, which I embed in the module, about the Warka Water Towers, which as, is an international project that was inspired by a trip to a village in Ethiopia that worked to solve the problem of bringing clean water to the people who lived there. This is my hook. I plan to bring globalized examples like this into every module I create and weave them throughout to expand our students' perspective when they are giving license to choose research topics for themselves. Ah. 
also in this module is a section that this audience might find interesting called Wikipedia for Good. This is one of the places that I use a video from Stanford History Education Group, uh, their work regarding civic online reasoning. In this particular video, they discuss how Wikipedia articles are maintained and how professional researchers use Wikipedia to find valuable sources. If you're not familiar with the civic online reasoning curriculum from the Stanford History Education Group, I highly recommend looking them up. Their, their information is uh, fascinating and accessible. The last two modules are not fully built out just yet, but I plan to do significant work on, work on them during our summer session, which begins the week after next. Um, what you see on the screen are the pages in the Using Library Resources section where I explain what a library database is and why one might want to use it instead of Google. I have videos that I have created explaining how to use a product that a, major, a majority of our California community colleges call OneSearch. This search is a majority of our databases at the same time, sort of a Google search engine for library resources. The joy of this section is that while the videos I have created are using my college library databases and one search box, this product is brought to us by the state of California, so most of us have a very similar interface on our library website, meaning my videos have the potential of being universally useful to my colleagues. And just as an aside, this is a chart uh, in the library resources section that describes the differences between library databases and websites in terms of cost to the student, privacy and security, reliability and features. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm trying to break up uh, the text whenever possible with images, infographics, charts and graphs and, and videos. Currently, my last module is about citing sources. This is not just how to cite, but why we cite. It also goes into six different forms of plagiarism. This is to underscore that one can even plagiarize accidentally, and the student needs to be vigilant about where they get their information and ideas. You can also see here that I've added a section on chat GPT and artificial intelligence. Since citation authorities like the American Psychological Association and the Modern Language Association have not yet come out with their official stance on how to cite sources like ChatGPT, this will be updated as time goes by. I can have a whole conversation about that. And lastly, I wanted to add that in this section, I have embedded some of, the, of my research guides that I've created on the subject of academic integrity and plagiarism. Uh, these guides can be used within the modules by scrolling the page area. Additionally, the student can click out of the guide and look at it in another tab on their browser and get more in-depth instruction in that particular area. So what's to come in the future? Um, of course, the more work I do on these modules, the more I realize that there is much more to do on these modules um, it's for them to reach their full potential. But for example, this is where we're going. Um, I'm going to add quizzes at the end of each module with a printable certificate so students can have proof of completion. I will also be adding globalized research examples to those modules that do not have them yet, but I also plan to weave each example throughout the modules in order to bring the students back to their original research prompt and show them how to put it, the concepts into action. While I've consulted colleagues um, and our online instruction design team on the content of the modules, they do still need to be tested by students and classroom faculty. Um, I did embed a feedback form into the faculty module for initial thoughts um, by those that are testing them out right now. Um, but I plan to do a more formal assessment in the fall once the modules are further polished. Uh, currently, I have five modules, but I think there's room for a sixth in this initial phase. And that one I'm planning to do is on misinformation, disinformation, and fake news. Um, I have the skeletal structure of that unit mapped out, and I also plan to make that a reality this summer. And lastly, I have a variety of professional learning opportunities lined up for these modules. This summer, I've been invited to provide instruction at our district's Summer Teaching Institute on how to access and use the modules. And as the fall semester begins, we have professional learning days called Flex Days, where I will be providing instruction to faculty on my campus. Of course, they've also been made available in Canvas Commons, which is where Canvas courses can be downloaded by any faculty member who has a Canvas account, regardless of their campus affiliation. So as promised, I have put the access information on the screen in case you're interested. This access will actually not expire. I've made these modules public for anyone with internet capability to look at and use at will. So you can't download them from here, but you can pull them up and, and, and use them. And they will get updated regularly. This is just the initial phase of the, prog the program, of the units. So there you go. Thank you for your time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Allison. And now we're going to move it on to our last Allison, Allison Tripp. If I can get it out. Okay. Yeah. 
All right, I'm gonna start over here. Eventually I'm gonna to move to the podium because I'm gonna show my website. Uh, so follow me as I move around the room. But I am the other Allison. I am an anthropology professor at Chafee College. And you've heard a lot about storytelling, so bear with me one more time. We're gonna hear about storytelling. Um, so why is TikTok so popular? And is it just a trend that we're gonna forget about in a couple years from now? How is artificial intelligence influencing the way we teach and how will it influence future job markets? All of these things are important and they are related actually to our evolutionary history and those are some of the things that I am going to talk about. Um, I can't promise that I can give you a way to make your curricula bulletproof, but I think I can provide some suggestions and so have my wonderful colleagues in terms of the creativity and things that we need to bring in. Um, so it's important for us to have curriculum that is engaging, that is dynamic, and that is equitable, of course, and those are some of the features that I'm going to focus on. And we also need to think about, of course, how do we prepare our students for the future, right? Uh, so that the things that we are experiencing right now might not be what are experiencing for our students five years from now or 10 years from now. So we have to continue to be mindful of these kind of cultural changes. And again, I believe this can relate to our, our evolutionary history. And if that doesn't make sense, don't worry. I'm going to take you on a little journey to a Paleolithic cave in just a minute. So we have three major forms of communication as humans. So the first is what I'm doing right now, right? So spoken. Um, the second would be both gestural, including body language. These two are both human universals, meaning that no matter how big or small the society is, no matter how remote they are, they all do these things. And that is because when something's a human universal, it was essential for our survival. This last form of communication, graphic, which sometimes evolved into writing in some cultures, is the most recent. So uh, writing itself is, is a very recent thing and it is not a human universal. Writing for a lot of cultures came by way of colonization or through missionaries. In some cultures, oral history was the most important thing and writing was just not something that was a necessity to them, so it never developed. But that does not mean that they did not have complex cultures just like we do here. So I wanna take you on a very quick trip back to the past. I am a Paleolithic archeologist and my background is actually in really ancient art. So those first forms of communication, the speaking and the gestures, those go back as far back as our species do. Maybe even predate in terms of 200 to 300,000 years ago. Some cultures then later started to put symbols in places like cave walls. And we start seeing symbols around 100,000 years ago in South Africa, they disappear. And then 40,000 years ago, we see just this explosion of different types of symbols. There's around 32 or so. So there are a lot of benefits to graphic communication, and I'm gonna give you two. These are coming from one of my colleagues who's uh, a TED fellow. Uh, so the first is that if you put a symbol on this board, for instance, like this, right, you don't have to be in close proximity. You're all in the room right now to hear me talk. The other part of this is if you put something on a wall, it's no longer ephemeral. Once I start talking, once I stop talking, once I stop moving my hands, that message is gone and you just have to remember it. So this creates permanence by drawing something in a particular spot. So this was really important for our ancestors. It provided a lot of advantages that spoken language at that point really just couldn't stand up to. So you might be wondering, what the heck does this have to do with your project, my epic project, right? <laughs> uh, so as as the title suggests, it's all about storytelling. Storytelling is a human universal, meaning that every single culture, again, does this. And so I wanted to integrate storytelling into my cultural anthropology course to make my, especially my homework assignments more dynamic, because I noticed that they were um, just 
more reading and, and writing based. So storytelling could be a great way to bring this into your classroom because it can help connect individuals to the larger historical and cultural context. So if you've thought about taking a high school history class and maybe you had to memorize a bunch of dates, it probably was like super boring, right? But if they told you about a soldier's day in the life and what they experienced, it brings it to life. And then you remember more and you get an emotional connection. So that can be really important. It can also, as we've been talking about, critical thinking is so important. It can help to stimulate that so you're thinking about how does this story connect to the textbook or this topic that we've covered. Related to this is that empathy is so important for us to develop, and Alyssa talked a lot about this, right? So when I was doing my interviews for my project, I was doing them over Zoom, and I would often have people say, I don't want to cry. And their eyes would well up, and I could hear their voice quiver, and even though they were telling me stories sometimes that were decades old, it still affected them. And even though I wasn't sitting in the same room with them, it was palpable. I could feel that emotion. It changed me. It changed the mood, right? So it can really help our, our listener to understand things from a new perspective. Uh, when I was doing my project, Okay, so I ended up deciding that I wanted to interview people for my project and I started off by contacting our media coordinator and um, her name is Melissa Pignon and she said, I got you, let's make a video. So basically she helped me create a call to action which explained my project and got people to be excited about it. They submitted then through a Google Doc form where they told me what they wanted to talk about and then I scheduled interview times with them. So that's that video there, I'm not gonna show that. Uh, underneath just a picture of me and then you can see some of the stories on here so you can see that there are some of these stories and then the topics and things like that so um, these could be integrated into somebody's course I ended up turning them into stories later they can be anywhere from 10 minutes to about 35 minutes so the longer ones are essentially they would be used as uh, homework Let me go to the next slide we cover these topics very broadly, sometimes they kind of mesh and two things will be covered, but basically it's like a student would be assigned a story that they would watch and an article. So instead of just reading two articles for homework and preparing that for class, they would watch a story, read an article about something else that was related to the topic. So here's a homework example that we'll look at and then I'm gonna show you a preview of Maria's story. So it says, read this week's article and watch Maria's story. Be prepared to discuss the following questions in our next class session. So number one, how can an immigrant's experience shape their sense of identity and belonging? Number two, in what ways is language connected to ethnicity and global politics? And number three, what is lost culturally when monolingualism is favored? So I created curriculum content to go with these stories so that anybody else would be able to integrate them and not have to think of that aspect of it or use some of it if that was helpful for them. So we're gonna watch a preview of Maria's story, fingers crossed. All right, so I'm only gonna play the first couple uh, minutes of this very quickly. Trigger warning, Maria's story discusses physical, financial, and emotional abuse that may be triggering for some listeners. Uh, as I was getting ready to graduate, like on my 18th birthday, uh, my brother was deported, right? So he, um, he was driving, I don't like I again that this is something that I haven't really inquired about the details because it's something that's really painful to my parents um but I I just know like we got a call from him on that day and he was like I have signed my my deportation I'm going back to Mexico um because we didn't know about our rights we didn't know about uh him having like the possibility of fighting whatever it was he needed to fight. Um, so he just said, like, I guess an attorney that was assigned to him uh, just told him, you have everything to lose. I just signed your letter and you have nothing else to worry about, right? Um, he left his uh, partner here and a little one. How does the immigrant experience shape an individual's sense of belonging and identity. And what does language have to do with all of this? Although Spanish has been spoken in the Southwest for over 400 years, 
The prevailing notion that immigrants should assimilate and speak English has frequently been a political issue. As we will explore, questions of identity and belonging are intimately tied with the English language in the United States. One important question to consider is, what is lost culturally when monolingualism is favored? Maria's story will explore these topics and many others. Our guiding questions for this story include, how does the immigrant experience shape an individual's sense of identity and belonging? In what ways is language connected to ethnicity and global politics? What is lost culturally when monolingualism is favored? Maria grew up in a small town near Guadalajara, Mexico. She loved being able to walk to school, hang out with her friends, and spend time with her family. Just because I loved going to school, I was, um, in Mexico, we call them like abanderados. Um, so like every Monday, uh, kind of like hear how they would do the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, right? Um, in Mexico, they do um, they do that, but it's typically on Mondays. Um, but then the, there's a certain group of kids that get to like hold the flag and march around the campus. So uh, for me, it was like, trying to keep up my grades to ensure that I got to that point in sixth grade of holding the flag because that's something all of my siblings got to do. So by me being the youngest, I was like, I want to live up to that legacy, right? And be able to, in sixth grade, hold the flag. Like I was able to hold it in uh, kindergarten. Um, and so I, for me, it was a mission. Okay. So that was just a very short um, version of that. Her full story is about 30 to 32 minutes or so. Um. There we go. So if we return to my question at the beginning, why is TikTok so popular? This started off as a dance app, right? And it rapidly turned into a bottom up storytelling app. And what I mean by that is storytelling is generally coming from a top down approach. We're hearing it in schools and songs from governments and things like that. So basically anybody who has a phone can broadcast themselves to the rest of the world. So anyone can tell that story and Thinking about the survival qualities of these human universals, I'm not surprised that TikTok has become this viral sensation, you know, among all, all countries and age groups. The other important transitional feature for this is gestures and spoken words are no longer ephemeral with technology, right? Now we can record ourselves so that you don't have to be there when somebody is producing that message. So it has those important qualities. In terms of AI, we have to be really mindful and think about uh, how can we assess critical thinking. And as all of my colleagues have shown, we have to be creative, right? Because things are changing at a very rapid pace. And I know that rightfully, we're all a little nervous about ChatGPT, but we don't want to be reactionary about it, right? So we can't just continue to do things that we did in the past. We have to really think about why am I assigning this? What am I trying to get out of this assignment? And you know, think about things from that perspective. And also to remember that while writing is really hailed in the Western world, it is not the only way to assess critical thinking or to evaluate comprehension. It's just an easy one, right? <laughs> but now there are many other ways that we can do this. So to kind of recap, Oral history and storytelling, not just for historians and anthropologists. This project was for my cultural anthropology class, but I teach the whole spectrum. And uh, when I teach biological anthropology, I created an assignment this semester where they had to pick an evolutionary force, and then they would have to create a storyboard, a video, or something like that, where they would have to explain that. And it was so fun to grade because I was able to see their creativity and I was able to see do they get it or not. Where are they having trouble? Where are they getting hung up? The other aspect, we've heard this quote, history is told by the winners. And as Amy has mentioned, as Tom has mentioned, a lot of times fields are not equitable. They're not representational. But oral history is because it helps to fill in the gaps. It brings up those marginalized populations who don't always have their voices being heard. 
It's also a really wonderful way to diversify curriculum. So for me, thinking about you know, homework and making that more exciting, my lectures are punctuated, but my homework was, was not as dynamic as what I was doing in the classroom. I imagine in the future that we are not just going to be submitting, say, a cover letter and your CV. You're probably going to have to submit a video where you have to sell yourself, talk about why you want that particular job. So this can be really good practice to help our students prepare for or the amount of video and audio that they're going to have to do and communicate with in the future that we didn't have to do growing up, right? So I think it can be a great way to prepare them for the future as well as diversify curriculum. That's all I have. Thank you. <laughs>Thank you so much, Allison. And now we have some time before uh, what is now going to be a 10-minute coffee break. We're going to shorten that coffee break a little so we can open it up to questions for uh, both Allison T, Allison G, and, and Tom. Yeah, I think we're getting a mic over to you now. Here it is. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, Allison T, uh, I, I, at the end of your thing, I'm going back to the 40,000 years yes. ago in the graphic cave. So we've gone all the way back to uh, having an image be our representational world. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, we're full circle. <laughs> the emoji of... Uh, this is also for Allison, um, Allison Tripp. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, I just wondered if you could speak a little bit about this idea of um, more permanence uh, that's coming with storytelling as we have these recorded videos. And um, while I think, as you mentioned, there's a lot of equity that can be involved with that, like where history is not only told by the winners anymore. Um, what are the downsides of not being able to move on from your narrative and invent a new story when you have to overwrite what would have previously been an oral or old story that kind of just you age or you change. Um, I just wondered if you could speak to kind of that, that other side of it. I haven't, that's, that's a great question. I haven't really thought a lot about that, but yes, in some cultures, memorizing a story is something that's been passed down for many, many generations, and there's not that creative aspect where you're trying to change the story. And I think that that is something that could also be kind of discussed and brought into the classroom in terms of why specifically, why are we memorizing the story for six generations, right? And I think they could get to that knowledge of, it's because it's telling us something that's critically valuable. Right? It's, it's knowledge that we have to pass on because if it does change too much or too fast, then you lose that cultural connection, that religious connection, or different aspects that are important to a particular society. So I think recognizing that could just be something that's important to bring up. Like, why are they doing that? So it's not a lack of creativity. It's, you know, yeah. Um, thank you for those presentations. They were awesome. And I have a question that uh, all three of you can maybe respond to. Um, you know, you're asking the students to generate a lot of really great content, especially to fill in gaps. But, you know, as these things become more permanent and as there's just a glut of content out there, what can we do to help our students curate it? And like maybe Allison G, you can also speak to this because it's part of you know information management, right? Um, there is so much content, and like you know before when people would turn things in on paper, okay, we're like, how long do I have to hold on to this before I can shred it? But now we have like so much, so much. So um, how do we figure out what it is that we can hold on to, should hold on to, and you know use for the future and make Make sure that those gaps stay filled and not just like overflowing with all this content that our students have created. Wow, that's a good question. <laughs> I think much like in your home when you have to decide what to keep and what to get rid of and what when to take your VHS and turn it into the DVD and when to take the DVD and turn it into the streaming, you know, it's it's a it's a personal thing. You know, you have to decide, you have to make the decision of what's going to be important and weigh, those, weigh the, the consequences and the, and the context of, of what's going on um, because there is too much. You know, there is too much and, and it, there's not, it, that's not gonna stop. So we have, to, we have to start looking at how we curate our own things and how, that, how we develop our own knowledge and what's important to keep as we cont continue to build and what can, what can fall away. 
because things have to fall away now. You know, it, we can't hold on to everything. You're right. But, you know, organization is, is huge. You know, how, what's your priorities, your organization, you know, how, how you decide to build that system. But you have to build a system now. You know, if you just let it all go, I mean, look at your inbox of your email, right? You know, if you just let it all go, what's your system of finding what's in there if, you're, if you keep 100,000 emails? You have to have something, something to, to work with. Um, but it's, it's a personal thing. We don't, we don't have the answer to give to everyone about how to curate their information. Um, but it's a, it's a great question. go to Tom um, like for your students when they're generating all this information about these scientists do you have them publish it anywhere like do you have them edit Wikipedia pages or you know try and like write a student generated textbook or something yeah that's a great question because uh, uh, I think one thing I, I, I have to be concerned about is uh, uh, privacy whether they will uh, allow me to disclose mm -hmm. their names. I want to give them the credit, right, you know, for creating you know, all this database, uh, but uh, you know, it, it's something that I probably even have to you know, consult with, with, my, uh, <laughs> with our uh, uh, legal counsel, right? <laughs> but uh, right now, all, all these uh, slides are kind of an, 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 an anonymous, right? Okay. Uh, but eventually, you know, I think it's something that I, ha I have to decide whether I should give credit, credit where credit is due. <laughs> yeah. And I think you know, you, you know, in answering your last question, I think you know, critical analysis, critical thinking is one of the you know, learning outcomes yeah. you know, of the college. So that <laughs> is also. I think also with your last question, part of it is just the journey, right? Like learning how to do a skill. So at some point they might, oh, I made this project a long time ago, I'm gonna delete it. But they still have that knowledge and that developed skill. So even if they delete it, it's like that can't be taken away. Any other questions? Yeah. I just have a quick question for Allison. Um, I tried to interview some of my students in my classes before, but I ran into IRB issues. Did you have to do IRB so, review? On um, I did, but here's the thing. So oral history is a protected class where you actually don't have to do IRB. Um, Chafee IRB is like, well, we still want to look over your stuff, you know? So <laughs> basically I had to fill out the form and then they had to come to the same conclusion. Um, I did have basically kind of like an informed consent document where I had them make sure that they were over 18 and make sure that they were telling a story at their own will. You know, I wasn't telling them what to say and they knew that this would be public, essentially, that they were giving this story to, to me and to the public. So it is a protected class. So if it's oral history, then you don't technically have to do an IRB. Thank you. Yeah, I think this will be the last question before our, our small coffee break. Great. So I actually just have two comments, um, not a question. One for Tom, because you brought up um, uh, Alfredo Quinones Hinosa as one of the uh, examples that you mentioned. I just want to sort of give props to our college. He went to our college, San Joaquin Delta <laughs> College. <laughs> um, just because we're all community college, we have to. We have to show pride, right, in our own respective institutions. And for Allison T., when you mentioned that in the future you may need to turn in a video, right, to mm -hmm. apply for a position. So I'm mentoring a part-time faculty member uh, who just in fact landed his full-time position. Congratulations to him. But uh, he talked about one interview process where there was no hiring committee, well there is a hiring committee, I'm sure there is, but when he was interviewed he had to record himself. Okay, so there's no hiring committee in front of you the questions would, he just asked, what he told me would just magically pop up, wow. and he would then answer the question recording himself, and he said how awkward that was. You can't read the room. You talked about, again, mm -hmm. body language. Yeah. You talk about reading, again, the interviewees. Um, and so I'm just saying, we're already there. It's already happening. And so, you're right, things are changing rapidly. Thank you. 
No, just a comment about that. Um, I was recently speaking with, I've been on a lot of hiring committees this year, and I was recently speaking to somebody else who was on another hiring committee, and they said that one of the reasons they're starting to do that is because if you don't have them, somebody on video, they're now putting it in and having ChatGPT bring up the answer, and they respond to what's coming up on their own screen. So when you video record them, they, wow. they, you see them thinking and responding. So even if they don't, and, and it's just something you have to deal with. Yeah, so that's, yeah, that's something that we're, that we're grappling with at the moment, yeah. So. Well, thank you for such a fabulous <laughs> panel. And we'll have 10 minutes to chat further.